Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Great. Happy 3rd of July. <laughs> right? It's Susan and I's anniversary. She put up with me 29 years. That's right. I don't know what got into her, but she, she picked me, so I'm, I'm rejoicing still today. But I tell you, the greatest thing is that Jesus Christ picked me. He offered himself, and I said, yes, Lord, and it's been the wonderful, most wonderful thing in my life. Amen? Amen. And surrounded by good people, good folk, church folk, family, it's a good day to celebrate. And in a country that we still have freedom. Amen? So I'm thankful for this 4th of July weekend that we can remember where we've come from. We may not be where we want to be, but we're blessed nonetheless to be in this great country. Amen? So I'm glad you're here. We're having dinner afterward. Dinner on the grounds, as the old timers used to say. You're welcome to stay. We want you to stay. And I know how Baptists are. Well, I didn't bring nothing. I'm not going to say. Listen, we know the rules. Linda, me and, me and Linda were talking about a minute ago. Her mama used to say, bring enough for your family and one more. And everybody will eat. And I've never been to a church function where they ran out of food. Usually people go out carrying a covered dish. And, and lots of food that they brought as well. So please stay afterward. Uh, I'll promise to be briefer. I don't know what that means. <laughs> if y'all stay. I know that we're going to be smelling food and it's going to be hard to concentrate. So um, we're here today to fellowship in the name and the purpose and the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm glad you're here. Sister, if you've got announcements, come on. Thank you for being right there. I can find you. Good morning. Good morning. Woo! She flashed me in the eyes. <laughs> now I can't see. I should have. All right. Follow along with me in your bulletin. Uh, we have our leaflets back there if you want to give some items to the men's and, win men's and women's shelter this morning. Um, and also today we're starting what we call our Christmas in July. So we're, we have a emphasis that we do at Christmas time. It's called Operation Bless Frankfurt. And we take up an offering uh, that we use at Christmas to buy gifts for our foster children that we adopt and also helping our shut-ins in both of our shelters. So there's envelopes for this offering. It's on the back table there of the sanctuary. Uh, cash is always acceptable. But if you pay by check, as always, make it out to the church. And then in the memo section, put Operation Bless Frankfurt or OBF. Just to remind you, if you still have a baby bottle from Baby Bottle Blessings, just bring it in, put it on the back table or that little offering table, and we will get it back to where it needs to go. And our Save the Dates now, of course, we're having one today. And then the next ones will be in the fall in September and October. And so be aware of those. If you have any plastic caps of any kind, please save those and bring them in and put them in our box. We're saving those for fit time for women to make uh, plastic benches. Um, our homeless mats ministry, the next time that they'll meet is July the 12th at 6.30. Uh, also on, on Wednesday night the 13th, we will have our business meeting. And Linda wanted me to announce, which, uh, Rusty's kind of gone over. We're having our indoor picnic today for the 4th of July, and it'll be right after church. Uh, so please stay, and, you know, as he said, we will have plenty of food. And if you didn't bring a dish, please stay anyway, <clears throat> because we're going to have games and prizes afterwards, and you may get lucky. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Part of why we're here this morning is to rejoice in God and His greatness. I hope that you're here for that reason. We can do that together through song. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation, the hymn tells us. If you're mistaken, the bulletin, you'll find that on page 14 in your hymnal rather than 124. Can we stand together as you turn to 14 and sing the first and last verses? Praise to the Lord. <coughs> mm, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. Praise. 
I just mentioned to you before we pray, sometimes these hymns have somewhat archaic language. This song was written a long, long time ago. And people have asked me, what do you mean gladly for a? Well, that's just an old word for ever. Forever we adore him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are indeed our Lord and the King of creation. And we ask this morning that you would inhabit our praise and our worship. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may have a seat. <clears throat> and as you do, let's turn together to hymn number 446. And let's sing, Take Time to Be Holy. <clears throat> Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing. I've been up here. And I promise I won't say too much. Joey's all worried about me talking too much. <laughs> Look, he's up there with his hand over his face like he's <laughs> fearful of what I'm going to say. Um, so <clears throat> I know it's 4th of July weekend and probably should have found something that was you know, more to the theme because I love a good theme. But um, and with all the things that Joe and I have going on recently and trying to start our journey and um, expanding our family and um, all the troubles that we've had, there's just been a lot of other things on my mind. And um, I've really been reading a lot of um, Christian-based books and devotionals trying to uh, ground myself. And um, anxiety's been up and just everything I turn to seems like it's been another scripture about uh, being calm and patient and hopeful. And um, so I've got two scriptures here that seem to be a good theme that keep popping up in a lot of the things that I read. Um, the first is Philippians 4, um, 
I just got my first pair of progressive contacts, so give me a second. Um, six, okay. <laughs> Um, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. And the second one that I really wanted to say, because I had about 12. <laughs> Joey's like, you got to narrow it down. Um, and so this is Jeremiah 11. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And um, so I just think that like, you know, I keep as hard as it is in the moment and all the things that we've had to go through in this process. Um, trying to, and I'm such a planner, <laughs> trying to understand why this journey has been so lengthy and, um, and that it, you know, there is an ultimate plan and it's all going to be for the best. So, thank you. Thank you, Clark. Our ushers are coming forward to receive the morning tithes and offerings. And as they do, I'll ask you if once again we can stand this morning and sing the doxology. If you don't know the words, it's there in your bulletin. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly. Andy, would you ask God to bless our offerings, please? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for giving us another opportunity to come to your house and worship you. And we want to thank you for giving us such a great nation where we can praise you and learn about you without having any anyone contradict us or or just go against us and just be with us and be in the service and just take this offering and bless it and use it to your to your needs. And most of all, we want to thank you.
if my people will humble themselves and pray. Thank you, Sandy. And thank you, Sue, for sharing your talents with us again this morning. It's just the more instruments, the better, right? Greg, bring your harmonica and your bass next week. We'll, we'll fix things up. It's, it's a special weekend, as you're all aware, unless you're completely deaf. Uh, and the people around you have not already been shooting fireworks for the last 10 days or so, like this is where I live. But let's sing a special hymn for that reason. 630, America the Beautiful. Once again, just remain seated. And once again, we'll sing just the first and last verses. 630. Amen. Glad you came. I tell you what, it looks good to look out and see all the red, the white, and the blue. Um, somebody said casual, so I challenged them. <laughs> we'll see if they say casual again, right? For those of you watching, I'm ready for your report on how I look. Um, I did notice a minute ago that Kathy Miller has a birthday today. Um, it showed up on Facebook when I was sharing our live, bro live broadcast, so hopefully Joe said last week he was able to get everything working where he could hear me on TV in his house, and so hopefully um, they're, they're able to get this broadcast today, and we could say, happy birthday, Kathy, we miss you too, it's time to come home, <laughs> amen, time to come back. Every time I see their post, um, they're posting about the lightning and the storms and the wind, and you know, they're close to the gulf down there, and um, they get a lot of bad weather. Well, it's better up here, so come on back. <laughs> anyway, this morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, and for just a minute, we're going, to, we're going to finally meet this guy we've been talking about, Saul, and we're going to look at his conversion experience. I think, well, what a great weekend this ties together with, uh, you know, the birth of this country that we live in and, and how things have maybe not always been the way the founding fathers wanted it to be but then if you read a little bit about the founding fathers we may not want to be like they were all the time amen but we're thankful that god is a god of mercy and he's a god of grace and he's watched over us and he's given us this opportunity as randy mentioned earlier to be able to be here and freely proclaim the bible the gospel of the lord jesus christ amen i don't really have a fear today that the government's going to come through the doors and armed and tell us we have to stop preaching Jesus. I don't, I don't have that fear today. Now, I've heard my whole life that that's, that's a possibility that one day we'll have to go underground. But in the meantime, we have that liberty. And, and you think about the liberty that we get from the bloodshed from Jesus Christ. You think about the liberty that we have that we fought for, um, that men and women have died for through the years so that we have this freedom. Let's not take it lightly. Amen. Let's keep our focus 
on the fact that we're here to be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. I had a had an older fellow ask me one time when he was so worried about people crossing the border. He said, well, I, I said I wasn't worried about it. He said, well, what are you going to do when everybody speaks Spanish? I said, I guess I'm going to learn Spanish so I can proclaim Jesus. Amen? Because that's my calling and that's what we're here to do, to love people and proclaim the good news that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's opposition to that at times, if you all noticed that. Well, back in the day, back in this day, we're talking about in the 30s A.D., there was opposition to the proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we saw last week, that a great persecution arose and people were being, being driven out and they were scattered. But what happened with the scattering? With the scattering came proclamation of the gospel to the known world at that time, the people that were around there. And people were becoming followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, back in chapter 8, um, we just saw the, st the stoning of Stephen. And we're introduced to this guy, Saul. Now, we don't really know how old Saul was. Some people say he was born in about the same time Jesus was, 4 B.C. Um, but here's the thing, they didn't really record the birthdays of just everyday folk. They, recorded, they had birthdays for the leaders and the kings and those kind of people. They were recognized as their birthday. But not just everyday people. It wasn't something that I'm sure moms knew. But it wasn't one, one of the things that we have a record of people celebrating all the time. So we don't know when Saul was born. Some people say he's born in 10 AD. I have no idea when he was born. But he's close to the age of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he wasn't born in a barrel. He wasn't born isolated from things that went on in Jerusalem. He knew about Jesus and he knew about the way. But he was rejecting because his teaching and his background was different. So let me read a verse here out of chapter 8. It says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. So we know that Saul was there. We know from previous chapter that he was also in agreement with the stoning of Stephen. So, so you have this guy, Saul. You think, well, why in the world would Luke, the writer of Acts, pull out this guy named Saul? And make a big deal about him. Well, because Luke, if you read all of Acts, you'll see Luke loved Paul. And now Paul and Saul, same guy. People say, well, why did he change his name? Well, he probably didn't. You see, Paul, Saul, was born in Tarsus, a, a Greek city. And he was what we've been talking about, a Hellenistic Jew. In other words, he spoke Greek. That's, that was his culture. He was born into the... But he was sold out to the law. He was sold out to Judaism. And people that were born in Greek cities, even though they were Jewish, they usually got a Greek name and they also got a Hebrew name. So Saul, you're familiar with, King Saul from the Old Testament of the tribe of Benjamin. And you have Saul, also we're told, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, so who is this Saul? Well, Saul's an interesting guy because when he gives us his genealogy later on in the New Testament, he tells us that he was born of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, very few in that day knew exactly what tribe they were from. Most of the time it didn't matter because after the dispersion and after the Babylonian exile and everybody was out and it came back and they were out for a very long time, people came back and they weren't necessarily sure what tribe they were from. And so... It was kind of a big melting pot. People knew that they, they, they were Jewish and they were of Jewish blood. Now the, the Levites and the Kohenites and those folks, they kind of kept up with their genealogy. But a lot of men in the tribe Benjamin had no idea. Saul, on the other hand, knew exactly who he was. He knew what tribe he was from. And he calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now that's to infer that he also spoke the lost language Hebrew. Most of them in this day spoke Aramaic rather than Hebrew. We, we, we even believe that Jesus in most of his ministry spoke Aramaic. But Jesus, of course, knew Hebrew as well. So Paul was proud. That means he could take the scrolls, he could take the Torah in that day, and he could read the actual Hebrew Torah and interpret it because he spoke Hebrew. But he also spoke Greek fluently. As a matter of fact, if you'll read the, the 13 books of the New Testament that this guy saw or Paul wrote, he has some phenomenal Greek. Now, He's all over the place. His thought, he followed his thought process. You remember, they didn't have typewriters. They could just backspace. They, he was, most of the time, Paul was speaking and, and Amanusens was writing. And they would write what Saul said. And every once in a while, like in Galatians, he says, See what large letters I write to you with. So Paul was also able to write in Greek 
or, or in Hebrew, but he had a sight problem. Well, we're going to see where that comes from probably here today. Um, if the Lord will walk with us this morning and, and bless the preaching of his word. So he, he was born in Tarsus, which is also a Roman city. So Paul, interesting enough, was a citizen of Israel, but he's also a citizen of Rome. Born citizen. Now that was a big deal back in that day because they could not take a Roman citizen. The Roman guards couldn't take a Roman citizen and beat him. He got to go to court first. And so remember at one point Paul was arrested and they began to beat him and he said, is it a light thing that you, you beat a Roman citizen? And the guard was like, well, wait a minute here. How are you a Roman citizen? He was speaking Greek and then he was speaking Hebrew to the crowd and everybody got quiet and he said, how, how, how is it that you're a Roman citizen? He said, I bought this at great price to me. How is it you call yourself a Roman citizen? Paul says, I was born a Roman citizen. So he was a citizen of two countries. I think that's something God worked out, amen? See, God, God had a plan for Saul even though Saul hated Jesus and hated the church, God had a plan for him. Paul also brags about the fact that he had gone through the rituals that were required as a Hebrew young boy and that he was raised and steeped in these things. Now, he was also very, very, very intelligent. And he showed great probability for being great. So we know that he's also a Pharisee. Now, Pharisee was not that easy to get into. He became a Pharisee, and when he was young, that was one of the great things he was part of. Now, a Pharisee, if you're not familiar with, is a fundamentalist of the day. They held to the Torah. They believed that the Word of God was important. They believed that what it taught was true. And there was the Pharisees and the Sadducees back in that day. And you've probably heard it said before, the Pharisees did everything proper. That's why they were fair, you see. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection or the spiritual world. That's why they were sad, you see. So if you ever want to figure out, one of them was extremely spiritual. The other one was like, yeah, no, not really. And they, and they held to the first five books and the first five books the Sadducees did and that only. But then they kind of spiritualized everything. So they, they really just wanted to kind of rule things. They wanted to be in control of things. So there's this huge argument going on in that day about the resurrection of the dead. Now Paul being a Pharisee believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not believe in that. And that became an arguing point through Paul's life. But that also was one of the reasons why when he met Jesus, he was willing to believe and commit to Jesus. So this is Paul. Oh, something else. Paul was highly trained. There was this, 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 this suppose there was this one teacher. You remember when they were arguing with Jesus about when you could divorce your wife or not? They asked, can we divorce our wife? Well, the reason why they asked that of Jesus is because there was this huge argument going on by two groups of Pharisees. One of them was led by this guy, Hillel. Now, Hillel supposedly had a son or a grandson named Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was known to be the greatest pharisaical teacher of that day. Paul just happens to be trained at the feet of Gamaliel. Now, what they would do is they would, they would look for disciples. And, and it was a great thing if, if, a, if, a, if a teacher, a rabbi, came around and said, I'd like to teach your son. I'd like to train your son. He shows great potential. And, and, and usually about 12, the young men would start doing their father's job. Whatever that was, that's what they were trained to do. Well, Paul was trained as a tent maker. So it's not that he came from uh, aristocracy. It's not that Paul came from a high-end family because they were trained as tent makers. And, and, and that worked out well for Saul later on in his life as a Christian, as a missionary. Because when, when times were tough or he went into a new city and he had no money or nobody there helping finance his preaching, he could make tents. And it's easy to carry around the tools of tent making. You can carry those around you in a satchel. You don't have to carry a, a lot of other stuff. So no matter where Paul or Saul was, he could always work to earn his keep so they wouldn't be a burden to the people he was telling about Jesus. So you, you know that he's trained. And you know that he's intelligent because Gamaliel at one point took him on as a student. He didn't take on many because Paul uses that also to say that he was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. In other words, he knew what he was talking about. So Paul has a lot to bring in, his, in who he is in his stature. 
He's also very proud of who he is and the training that he's had. And, and, and so when he was there at this synagogue where Stephen was preaching about Jesus and it was a Hellenistic synagogue, Paul was most likely there. That's why he's present and he's ready to stone. As a matter of fact, as I said last week, I expect there was some interchange between Stephen and Saul. Because Saul was happy when they began to stone him. He said, hey, lay your coats here. I'll watch over those while you all stone him to death. So, so this is Saul. And then he, he realized that people got excited about that. And that this was a good thing. That we need to start killing these people of the way. Now that's what they called Christians in the day. People of the way. Why would they do that? Well, what did Jesus say? I am the way. The truth and the life. No man comes into the Father but by me. And that made all the Pharisees mad. So Paul was there and he was witnessing this. And so in, in chapter 9, we have the conversion of Saul. This is where Saul gets saved. This is where he submits to Jesus Christ. And, and so Luke, being the author of Acts, this is a big deal because Paul's his hero. You can tell by the way he writes. I mean, he's talking about Stephen. He's talking about Philip. And then there's Paul. And the rest of the book is about Paul. And you can tell that, that, that Luke really admired Paul. And so here's how he introduces the conversion of Saul, who also was called Paul. Now Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him. So here's, here's Paul. He's still breathing out. I, I, I used to follow this, this fundamentalist preacher. and Boy, he would get wild here about how mad Saul was about these Christians. He's, he's breathing out death and slaughter and murder. He was mad at them. Let's, let's kill them all. All the Christians. This is Saul. A man whom God chose to use. Already had plans for him. Can God love the unlovable? Can God love the murderer? Can God love the murderer that, that murders Christians because he hates him and, and doesn't believe in Jesus and thinks this is all hokey pokey and made up? That's what we have a picture of here is the mercy and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ even for a scoundrel named Saul who hated him and his people. So what do we see? We see that Saul had a hard heart. Saul had an extremely hard heart and he was against the people of God. But he was not outside of the reach of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't want to tell you, nobody's outside of the reach of the Lord Jesus Christ. That blood was shed on the cross is enough blood to save everybody ever born from Adam on. Whoever the last birth will be, the blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's tree 2,000 years ago is sufficient for their salvation. Amen? No matter how bad, no matter how mean, no matter how evil, Jesus Christ can save you if you'll come to Him and receive what He offers, and that is salvation through faith. Not your works. Can you imagine if Saul had to earn his way into heaven what he did to Christians? As a matter of fact, he, say, he sees of himself absolutely unworthy of the mercy and grace of Christ. Yet he received the grace of and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he got it in a very harsh way. God got his attention. So let's look at this. So first thing we see is he had a very hard heart. We also see that he was headed out to destroy the way. It says at verse 2, And he asked for letters from him, from the high priest, to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if any be found belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. That's his whole goal. He, he said, he said let, me, let, me, let, me, let me have a letter from you, the high priest, and let me go into these synagogues up around Damascus, up, up in this area where there's Hellenists and where the gospel is spread. He said, here's what I want to do. If there's a man, if there's a woman that believes in Jesus Christ, I want to arrest them because of their belief. Because they believed in Jesus Christ. You see, Paul had anger and he had hatred. And he headed out to stomp it out. Paul was full of zeal. Paul believed he was right. Now see, there's a problem. I, I have been in several places where, um, where, where sometimes Christianity may get just a little bit lax and, and we want to start receiving all the other 
all the other different religions in. And, and we like to say, well, you know, all paths lead to God. That's not true. You probably got family. You probably got friends. Maybe they're caught up in a cult. Maybe they're caught up in, in a religion that doesn't have Jesus Christ as a head. Or they got a Jesus Christ that's not the Jesus Christ represented in Scripture. And I want to say that Jesus Christ himself said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Nobody gets to God but through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I don't care how well you believe or how convicted you are that these other religions will get you there because maybe they're peace-loving religions or they're this or they're that. Jesus said you've got to come through the blood or you don't come at all. That means even Paul, who was trained in Judaism, believed in God the Father, believed in the God of Abraham, did the things that were required in what we call the Old Testament, he still needed salvation. That's one of the things that people miss. You know, the mother of Jesus needs to be saved. And a lot of people struggle with that. The people need to be saved. They need Jesus. You wonder why the world's in the mess it is today? Folks need Jesus. And then I've, I've met Christians that are born-again believers... You know what they need? They need a shot of the Holy Ghost because they've grown bitter or they've grown this or they've gotten that way and, and, they, and they don't have the love, they don't have the mercy, they don't have the compassion that they should have as Christians because they've gotten away from the truth that Jesus is the way. Whatever the question is, Jesus is the answer. You say, what's wrong with the world today? They need Jesus. What's wrong with the church today? They need Jesus. They've forgotten where they were from. So Paul had a hard heart. Paul was headed out to do damage to the church. Paul already had somebody watching him. And his name is Jesus. And here's what I like. God could have chosen somebody else to be the minister, the apostle to the Gentiles. I mean, if you look at it, God can choose anybody, right? What did he do? He already had his eye on Paul. He had groomed Paul. Even when Paul wasn't a believer, God had arranged the life of Paul for this day. I believe that. I believe that God works in our lives. I, I think that God knows who's going to come to him in faith. Don't you? I don't, believe because, I don't believe because that he makes you come to him in faith. I still believe it's free will. I believe Paul had a choice on the roadside. But did God know how Paul was going to go? Sure he did. So let's, let's look at this event. So he's mad. He's riding out with a contingency of people. And in verse 3 says, And as he was traveling, it happened that as he was approaching Damascus, that suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. Now, I know a lot of people want that kind of experience. They want to get saved. When God sends a light and knocks me down off my horse, then I'm going to believe in him. Well, good luck with that. He only did that one time in all of recorded history that God show up this way. Some people say, well, you know what I want? I want a burning bush. Well, God did that one time. I want God to tell me to build an ark to save the world. God only did that one time. See, the problem is we look at the things in Scripture and we say, that's the kind of experience... I have to have or I'm not going to believe in him. You have that choice to not believe in him. You cannot choose the consequences. And that's what a lot of people forget. Is they think, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to reject Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to reject God. But, but I also believe that if there is a God, he's going to love me in spite of that. You need to read the rest of the book. And what he says about this great lake of fire. People are so worried about, you know the way Christians are not as loving as we should or we've got a history that's not good. You know, they point back to the Crusades or they point back to this or that their neighbor who claims to be a deacon is the meanest guy on the street. You can't have anybody between you and Jesus. You've got to look at Jesus, not people that claim to know him. Study Jesus and you'll figure out who Jesus is. So here's Paul. He's headed out. He gets hit by this blinding light. Did anybody deserve to get hit by a blinding light like Paul? He needed it. So he fell to the ground and heard the voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Can you imagine that? That's a pretty personal experience, isn't it? Knocked off his horse. He needed it. He needed it bad. And he said, who are you, Lord? That's an interesting word there, isn't it? That word means master. Who are you, master? 
I, I think already Paul's getting an idea that this is something abnormal. This is not your normal getting knocked off your horse. There's something going on here. See, he was a very spiritual, religious person. He was just hitched to the wrong cart. And he thought the old ways were the only ways. And he denied Jesus entirely. And so we see that Saul, he headed, he heard the call from the Lord right here. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Interesting question. It's an interesting study to go through Scripture and see the people that God names twice. Samuel, Samuel. I mean, there's several places in Scripture God says their name twice. So it's interesting. How well do you think Paul knew the Old Testament? I'd say he knew it well. I'd say he knew everywhere in there where God repeated the name of the person that he's talking to. And so he gets knocked off his horse by a blinding light while he's heading out to destroy the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because he believes it's all fake and it's all a forgery. But he's a Pharisee, so he believes in the resurrection. And then he hears, Saul, Saul. I'm sure his mind harking back. He's like, well, that's some Old Testament stuff there. Although he wouldn't have said Old Testament. He would have said that's some Testament stuff there. And it was Jesus Christ himself. Now he knew whoever or whatever was talking to him was not one of the guys he was riding with. Because later on in Acts we hear that they heard some thundering, but they didn't hear the voice. See, God spoke through all of that and that blinding light that knocked him down. And he named him by name twice. And Saul, being aware of how God operates, said, maybe I better verify this. Who are you, Master? Because he assumed it was God. And he said, who are you, Master? And I love how Jesus answered that. He said, and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You think you're right. I am who they say I am. I want to tell you, that changed his life. Amen? But get up, enter the city, and, and you will be told what you must do. He heard from Jesus. That's why Paul can call himself an apostle. He was sent by Jesus Christ himself. Well, Saul had a problem at that moment. Verse 7 says, The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. And we know later on in Acts they actually heard the rumblings. They heard the rumblings, which was the voice. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. Isn't that amazing? He, he's, he's knocked off his horse. He's so convinced that Jesus is not true. Do you have a family member? Do you have a relative? Do you have a friend who believes that there's no truth to Jesus? Don't you wish every once in a while they get knocked off their horse? And I think, you know, the, Jesus told his disciples, you are going to be the light. Now, this is a special occasion for Paul because God had a purpose for the spread of the gospel. He doesn't do it this way anymore. He only done it this one time. But he went after Paul. Paul became a believer because of what had happened. And his eyes were open, but he could not see. That's literally what happened to him physically. Now, think about the implication of that spiritually. His eyes were open, but he could not see. You know, we got so many people talking about being woke today. I used to like that term, woke, about 15 years ago. But now people have taken that word woke, and I look at them and I hear what they have to say, and I think, your eyes are open, but you do not see. They miss Jesus Christ, the glorious King of the universe. Paul, who loved God and loved the Old Testament, loved the teachings and loved the law and loved all those traditions. He loved all that. He could not see who Jesus was. Now, Jesus' ministry on the earth was finished. He did the healings. He raised the dead. He restored sight on several occasions. He rose from the dead, which Paul claimed to believe in. But he denied that Jesus rose from the dead. Paul wasn't looking for this kind of Savior. He was looking for the old kind of Savior that was going to ride in on the white horse. 
and free Israel from Rome and give them the land. See, they missed Jesus because their expectations were wrong. And this is who Paul was. His expectations of who Christ is or would be is wrong. And I know people today that look around and say, you know, why if God is a good God is there so much harm in the world? It's an easy answered question. God gave us free will. You can choose to do good. You can choose to do evil. You can't choose the consequences though. And that's the problem. People miss out on that. They want to live any way they want to live and God looked the other way. Doesn't work that way. So Paul said, who are you? Jesus said without saying, I am the resurrected Jesus Christ. That thing you claim to believe in as a Pharisee. That big deal in the Pharisaical life. I'm the resurrected Jesus. I am alive. And that changed Paul's whole perspective. So he gets up. He opens his eyes. His eyes are open. He cannot see. He got up from the ground. And though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. Where was he headed in the first place? Damascus. What was he going to do when he got there? Arrest all the Christians. With the hope of stoning them. That's interesting because that plays into this next part of the story. And he was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. I'm sure he was a little bit overwhelmed with his eyes open and no sight thing. But I also believe he had something happen to him on the road that he didn't understand and he didn't foresee. And I, I think he was probably in a form of fasting. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, spoke to Paul out loud, spoke to Ananias in a vision. It's funny how God does things differently, isn't it? Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. Ananias is only mentioned once. He didn't say, Ananias, Ananias. Isn't God funny? There's so much that we can study and never get to the bottom of. Verse 11 says, And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus whose name is Saul. He is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him that he might regain his sight. So, God says, Ananias. He said, yes, Lord, here I am. He said, I got a job for you. You're going to love it. Okay, what do you want me to do? Anything, Lord, I'll do anything. Well, there's this guy named Saul from Tarsus. You think Ananias had heard of Saul from Tarsus? Well, the text is going to tell us in just a second that he did. He said, I want you to go lay your hands on him and heal him for he's been praying. Can you imagine Ananias? Well, maybe not. Why don't we just leave him blind? That way he can't find us. Because he's not going to be a challenge with a stick or somebody leading him by hand to come capture the Christians, is he? They could just run. He'd never find them. And, and God says to Ananias, I want you to go to him and lay your hands on him. So see, Saul was healed by a wary but willing servant of the Lord. Sometimes God's going to ask you to do things that don't make sense. He's going to ask you to do things that don't make sense. But they're for his kingdom. Amen? Ananias answered in verse 13, Lord, I have heard many things about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. See, word about Paul spreading. The churches were on the run from Paul. Lord, I've heard of him. I know what you're asking me to do. I've heard of this guy. He's dangerous. We really don't need him in our group. Now, can you imagine in, in churches today, you ever had anybody walk in the back door and you've got to wonder, what do they want? Now, in, in the mountains, the, the towns are a little bit closer. Frankfurt's a little bit spread out. But, but in the mountains, every once in a while, somebody would come in and everybody would get nervous because this guy was from the wrong family. Or this guy had the wrong track record. Or this guy this or this guy that. Remember I told you a few, I told some of you about a guy that came to me one day and he came into my office all the way in the back and um, he was known to drink a lot of alcohol. And you never knew which, which person you were going to get. Sometimes he was right on the edge of threatening. But I, I tried to minister to him anyway. And he came into my office one day and he's a little bit inebriated. And we began to talk about Jesus Christ being the only way. And he, he became very agitated at that. And, and I told him, I said, Jim, you need Jesus in your life. You need to meet my Savior. 
You, you need to bow your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ now because you don't want to have to do it later. You want to meet him as Lord, not as judge. Amen? And he said, I'll never bow my knee. Never bow my knee to Jesus. And he got up and his life was a wreck. And he was stumbling around my office. And he said, I'm going home. I'm going to blow my brains out when I get there. And I'm not going to pray for Jesus. So I, he, he left and I called the law. And the law said, yeah, we get that from him all the time. We'll check on him. Because I figured that was my responsibility to call. I didn't hear from him for a while. I'd see him every once in a while. He was the kind, he called me at the power center. He said, can you give me a ride? Or he'd knock on the front door. Can you give me a ride home? We well, lived a quarter mile up the road. So most of the time, I'd say, sure, jump in the vehicle, we'll go. And every once in a while, he'd say, hey, turn in right here. I'd turn in somewhere. And he, he said, I need some cigarettes. And so he'd go in to buy cigarettes and come out with a six-pack. And I'm like, really? You're using the preacher to drive you to get beer and drive you home. He was, he was crazy that way. Had him call me one night in the middle of the night, Saturday night, 3 o'clock in the morning. I need you to come get me. Some guys are trying to beat me up, and I, I have no way home. So I drove all the way to the next town over to the county seat to pick him up. He was sitting out front, inebriated, and he said, can you take me home? So I took one, one of the back row. He said, go that way because I'm afraid those guys are looking out for us. I said, okay, I'll go this way. And we're out in the middle of nowhere, and he says, make a right right here. I'm like, what's down this road? I turn, and the sign said VFW. <laughs> I said, you, pick, you had me pick you up at a bar and take you to another bar, Jim. We well, used to go on home preaching. I said, Jim, don't ever call me again on a Saturday night. I'm preaching in the morning at the church. And it's, it's going on four. And I'm out driving you from bar to bar. He just didn't get it. But he told me that he would never bow the knee to Jesus Christ. So I kind of wrote him off. I figured, well, he's telling the truth. But God was working on Jim. God was getting into Jim's life. That's why, you ever met somebody that's under conviction? Me? Oh, they're mean. <coughs> Aggravated about everything. One night I'm out beside my house. And I look up. And he's walking over to me. He's making a beeline, walking across parking lots. He sees me outside. I'm outside with my family. I tell them, y'all go in. I don't know what this is going to be. And he walks all the way over to me, and he's crying. And I thought, well, something bad's happened, or he's planning something bad. I mean, you never know what you're going to get, right? And he was crying. It was raining. Starting to rain. The ground was muddy. And he said, I need to get saved. I said, what do you mean by that, Jim? He said, I need to receive Jesus. Will you pray with me? I said, be glad to. I was sitting outside on a picnic table and I said, have a seat. He said, I can't. I said, why not? He said, I got to kneel. He stuck his knees down in that mud and cried his way to Jesus. And within a year he was dead. His, he'd killed his liver. But I'll see him again. I'll see him again. And I've got a dear sister down in the mountains that he had fathered a child by another lady. And the test come back and said, 95% your child. He said, see, he's not my child. I said, he's your child. If you can see this child, you know it's his child. That child was born into a pretty bad situation. But God saw fit to get this child out of this situation. and Put that child with a lady in the church who is a Jesus lover. And she's been raising that kid. He's uh, 16 years old now. And every time I see a picture of him on the internet, he looks just exactly like his daddy. But this kid loves Jesus. This kid loves going to church. And so when I think about Paul, and I think about people that can't be possibly saved, God reminds me of Jim Green. Get on his knees. Crying out for Jesus to save him. And you know what he did? He saved him. He saved him. He did good for a while, but he had an awful bad demon in his life, but he was also very, very sick. And the sicker he got, the more he kind of fell back into his old ways. But even up until his death, he claimed Jesus Christ as his Savior. One of the best pictures I got is me standing in front of my house with Jim on one side and another fellow I got to relieve to the Lord and baptize as well. 
on the other side who swore he'd never believe in Jesus. And there I am, this city boy. That's what they considered me because I was born in Lexington. You know, if you're not born in the mountains, you're not of the mountains, you, you, can, you can be here, but you're not of us, right? But I got a chance to lead some people to the Lord I didn't think God could or would save. And I look at Paul, and I think about Ananias. And I've gone into some places where I felt the urging of the Lord. Now, Paul got the blinding light in the voice of Christ. Ananias had a vision with the voice of Jesus. I get some sort of urging. I would just love to hear a voice, you know, or, or see a vision, wouldn't you? But, but God's, got, God's got a way of speaking into our spirit. And, and letting us know that these are some things. You're just, you're just driven to do it. You're just urged to do it. Last Sunday, my, bro, my uncle was here. He said, I've got a friend of mine and she's sick. I think it's terminal. He said, I'm going to go try to talk to her. But I don't think she's saved. He said, if I call you, will you come? He said, I've got to go and I've got to go today. He said, I don't know what it is. I said, I know what it is. It's the urging of the Holy Spirit. My uncle hadn't been saved long, but he's a little evangelist. He wants people to get saved. And so last Sunday, about 2.30, I got the call. He said, hey, can you come to Monterey? He said, I'll meet you at the store in Monterey. Now, you know Monterey's small when they talk about the store, right? <laughs> I knew Monterey had a boat ramp, but I didn't know it had a store. Because <laughs> I used to put a boat in at Monterey. I said, I'll be glad to. I'll head that way. When I got there, he met me and I followed him up to a little old trailer and a lady in the bed fighting cancer. Heard he had half of one of her lungs removed. And we talked a little while and it just so happens that she's down from the Corbin area and down in that region and I know a lot of people down there and she knows a lot of people down there. She's been up here since 65. And we got to talking and after a little while, my uncle couldn't stand it. He said, you know, we're here because we want to know about your soul. Have you ever seen Jesus as your Savior? And, and she had already confessed to me that she was a believer. She believed in God. You know, I was kind of working into it. But, you know, evangelists don't let you work into nothing. They won't know, are you saved? And he said plainly, have you ever prayed to receive Jesus as your Savior? And she said, no. And I said, would you like to? She said, yes. So kneeling on the floor in this trailer with her daughter watching, I showed her what the Bible says about Jesus and I said, would you like to pray to receive Christ as your Savior? She said, yes. I said, do you believe what I've told you? She said, yes. And so I said, well, I want to open in prayer. And then I want you to pray the best way you know how. And tell Jesus what you believe about what I've told you today. And so I prayed beautiful pastoral opening prayer. You know how it is. <laughs> and I just paused. And after a little bit of time, she said, yes. Never said another word. My brother-in-law, my, my uncle didn't know what to do with that. Yes. Because he was so programmed with the Lord, with the sinner's prayer. But you know, you've got to say the words. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says you've got to believe. Yes. To me meant she believed. And all that I had showed her about Jesus. So she said, yes. My uncle's eyes opened. Looked at me. And I just closed the prayer. Lord, I thank you today for her faith. Enough faith to open her mouth and say yes. And so we talked for a little while longer. I talked to her about it. It's my mom's birthday. It's an easy day to remember. This is the day you should remember. And I talked to her for a little while. And I talked to her daughter. Daughter confirmed that she was a believer. And and, you know, her husband was out on the porch and we talked about Jesus a little bit. Then me and my uncle went and stood by the truck, talked a whole other hour because you ever been around an evangelist when somebody gets saved, they just can't come down. So it's like, you know, excitement. We talk, 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 talk. He said, I had no idea what you would do with yes. He said, what in the world does yes mean? I said, yes means she believes everything we talked about. And I said, I'm going to guess she's not an out loud praying person. Jesus doesn't hold that against you, does he? The Bible says if you believe in your heart, right? And with your mouth make confession. Yes is a confession. I confess that I believe what you just told me. 
And you just never know when God's going to give you that opportunity. As I say, I'm not an evangelist. I'm a midwife. I'm usually there to catch. Somebody else has done all the work. Somebody else has already prepped the ground. Somebody's already told them about Jesus. They've been in church. They've been in Sunday school. There's some little Sunday school teacher that poured their heart out to somebody. And they never got saved. And they never saw that fruit. And they got out in life and got away from them. Don't know who they are or where they are. But one day they walk in and they talk to a little guy named Rusty. And they say, I'd like to be saved. I never have been. But they've been taught. They've been trained. God has prepared. God has worked. And they're ready just falling off the vine. You just got to pick the fruit. Amen? Saul was ready. Ananias, a little bit iffy on this situation. What am I going into? What's going to happen? He's got papers on his possession that he can put me in jail. And Lord, you want me to go here now, talk to this guy? I like Ananias, though. Because he was healed by a wary but willing servant of the Lord. Verse 13 again says, But Ananias answered, Lord... I have heard from many about this man how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed into the house, and after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, I bet that was difficult, wasn't it? The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we have the final couple verses. Saul heeded the call to surrender and serve. Verse 18, I like this about Saul. I like that word immediately. Immediately. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Paul got saved and Paul sold out. He got saved and he said, I, anywhere you want to go. He got saved and he surrendered. He, got in, he was already primed and ready to go. Like I was talking about those children a minute ago or even adults now who were trained as children in the ways of Jesus. That stuff never goes bad. When that seed is planted, it's in there and they're just waiting. That's one of the reasons why I love to work in Awana. We worked in Awana through most of our ministry so far because those, one of the first things Awana does is it teaches the gospel. That there's God. That there's Jesus, He died. That, that you're a sinner and you need salvation. They don't get that for a while. Their friends are sinners, but they're not. But you know what that Word of God does in their lives? It begins to grow and it begins to show them. See, that, that, that teacher talked about sin. That teacher talked about separation. That teacher talked about salvation. And it may take 20 years of that seed in there. And they'll have a few run-ins with Christians along the way that encourage it. They may have some that discourage it. But, but, but along the way, they'll, they'll keep hearing people that say the same thing, that you're a sinner in need of salvation. Paul thought he was perfect. He kept the law. He says later on in the New Testament he was faultless according to the laws and traditions. He thought he was where he needed to be. He was a good person person he was a sinner in need of a savior the Bible says for there are none good no not one all are fallen and in need of salvation God had his hand in Paul's life so that he'd be ready when that light knocked him off his horse and the Lord spoke to him what are you doing Saul Saul what are you doing who are you I am Jesus whom you persecute. And he just got saved and sold out. And you say, well, why is this important? Why are we going so long on the salvation of Paul? I mean, I dare say the vast majority of us in here today, if not all of us, are born-again believers. We've given our life over to Christ and we've received forgiveness of sins. Why go over this? Well, because your salvation sets you up for service. It empowers you to serve the Lord. In many different ways. And he has a role for you. Now, 
None of us have the role Paul had. Paul was one of a kind. He brought the gospel to the Gentiles. And he lived the rest of his life ministering to the Gentiles. And was murdered by the Jews, as we'll see in this, as we go through Acts. We're going to start looking at his missionary journeys next. And we'll, we'll go by leaps and bounds from now on. But the beginning of Acts shows us how the church got started. And how God used those weak little disciples that never got anything right. The whole time Christ was with them. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then God chose this junkyard dog named Saul. Saved him. And sent him out. Don't you know Paul went out humbly preaching Jesus Christ? He believed with all of his heart in who Jesus was. So much so that he actually went to his death. And the author, Luke, loved him. He loved Paul. And I think that's something for us to focus on. Salvation. Salvation. So let me ask you this morning, are you in here today? And First of all, are you where you need to be? Or, or think about being Ananias. I mean, would you go? Would you go into a place where there's somebody dangerous? I mean, I, I've, got, I've got friends of mine that, that came, from, came to Clear Creek while I was there. And, and they were from the Philippines. Funny little couple people. He was 70. And she was almost 70. And they were coming to Clear Creek to go to the mission field. That, that's, that's a late, late life, right? But here's what's interesting. They were able to go. He had medical experience. She had medical experience. And they went to one of the most dangerous places in the world for Christians to be. To preach Jesus. To love people. And they weren't suspected of being missionaries. Because they were dark skinned from the Philippines. They expected an American to show up. But God's got undercover agents. And he'll call you at 70 years old to do something you think is impossible. And while they were in this place that so all the Christians there were undercover. While they were there, one day a gunman, or several gunmen came into the hospital looking for Christians. Because they were making waves. They were teaching people about Jesus. They came in looking for Christians and the Lord blinded the eyes of the gunman. And that's only been 10, 12 years ago. God still has a role for you to do. No matter how old, no matter how feeble you feel, no matter how worthless you feel, he can use people in their 70s and he can use murderers. Paul was a murderer to preach his word. I'm proud to be an American, but I'm more proud to be a Christian. I'm absolutely thrilled to death to be washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what happens in my life today, tomorrow, He's got me. Amen. If you're in here today and you don't know him as your Savior, I'd like you to take an opportunity to talk to me about it. I hope today that I've planted another seed in your life that's going to grow. Maybe, maybe I've encouraged a previous seed that was sown that you disregarded. And you've just never came to the place where you made a commitment to Christ. Just ask him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Which is what he says he will do. But he won't force you. Paul had a choice. He won't force you. If you'd like to do that this morning, I'd like you to come talk to me. And we can talk about your soul. We're going to have a dinner in a minute. We've got plenty of time. We can talk. I never turn my phone off. I may not hear it, but I don't turn it off. I'll get back to you. Maybe you're in here today and you're thinking, you know, I think I want to be a part of this, what God's doing at Calvary. I'd like to move my membership here. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I've been a Christian for a long time, but I never was baptized. You see, what Paul do? Paul got up and immediately got baptized. And so sometimes we wait a little while and we don't do it and then we feel kind of funny about doing it. I've baptized lots of people that were saved 20 years ago. I got saved at 7, baptized at 12. Wondered if it took, thought about doing it a couple more times. Maybe you're in here today and you just need prayer. And you just like to walk down the aisle a minute and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I've got a struggle in my life. I'll turn my mic off. Anything you tell me just stays here with me. Maybe today you just need a chance to stand and pray and let God wash over you, to cleanse you, to renew your faith, to renew your dedication, to renew your commitment.
Maybe today be a good day for a revival in your life. And I believe that if you'll ask God to revive you and walk with you, He will. I believe that. Whatever you need to do today, we're going to have a time of invitation. If you need to do something for the Lord, you can stand up and do it where you're at. If you need to walk down the aisle and present yourself as membership, for membership. If you need to walk down the aisle and have me pray with you about something you're struggling with, this is your opportunity. It's called an invitation. You're invited to act this morning on what the Spirit of God has said to you. So if you would, would you come, Brother Tony, and lead us in an invitation? Why don't we stand together? We can sing number 296. 296. <clears throat> Jesus is Lord of all. <clears throat> Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life, my hope, my glory, my all. Wonderful Master in joy and in strife, on Him you too may call. Jesus is Jesus is Lord of all.